Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my comments this morning will focus mainly on biotechnology, but many of the concepts in entrepreneurship and the role of faculty members will be applicable to all sections of incorporating science and industry. I'm going to make several key points. First of all, innovation in drug development particularly is done in small startup companies. The history tells us that large companies often miss developments in science and technology that can lead to drugs. And that is the small innovative com companies that grow and produce important products. Secondly, all of this stems from research and development at universities and research hospitals. It's really the core infrastructure of research that both creates the concepts and trains the workers who will go and work in these companies. Workers not just in science and engineering, but workers in finance, in patent law, in marketing, and many other things. And the key, to, in my experience, is faculty members who, besides running research labs and teaching, are entrepreneurs and work with and help start a number of companies. I'll give you examples from my own career and several other companies in Boston that are growing very rapidly, developing whole new types of treatments and diagnostics. I'll talk about some general principles of starting biotech companies. Not just starting, but starting companies that grow and become real companies. And then finally, this innovation by the state of Massachusetts, the Life Sciences Center, that has provided a huge amount of infrastructure to encourage economic growth through the development of biotechnology. So from my own career, I have been involved in starting seven companies. As you can see, two of them failed and lost investors and myself several million dollars. That's OK. This is a risky business, and many of the companies that one starts are not successful. But you also notice that two of the companies that I helped start, Genzyme and Millennium Pharmaceuticals, are extremely large, prosperous companies. Genzyme, and I'll talk about it, was sold a few years ago for 20 billion US dollars and employs 10,000 people. That's a large part of an economy. Millennium was sold for almost 10 billion dollars to Takeda Pharmaceuticals and employs several thousand people. It's now the oncology group. I'll talk also about Rubius, a new company that stems directly from research in my lab. And then, of course, the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center. And let me start with faculty as entrepreneurs. MIT, like most American research universities, gives faculty members one day a week outside consulting privileges. We can work, as I do and many of my colleagues do, for not-for-profit organizations. I'm on the board of Boston Children's Hospital, and I do not get paid for that. But we're also allowed and encouraged to start for-profit companies and work with them. We are not allowed to be operating officers of the company. I cannot be the president or the director of research, but I can and do sit on advisory boards, boards of directors, and really lead the company or at least have oversight as to the directions of the company. And I'll give you some examples. There are also clear conflict of interest rules. 
so that we can keep our responsibilities to the university and our students and our research separate from our work with the companies. This is the group that started Genzyme 40, almost 40 years ago. Eight academic scientists. Two points. First of all, we come from very diverse research areas. And given the complexity of what Genzyme has done in terms of developing drugs, this is important. Colleagues working in engineering, in bioprocess engineering, pathway engineering, to microbiology, enzymology, and myself, cell biology. Second, I point out that four of us are members of the National Academy of Sciences. This is not to boast, but to point out that it is actually the leading scientists in the United States that also become entrepreneurs. Let me talk about Genzyme and its innovations. And this is something that was done 35 years ago. It developed a carbohydrate named hyaluronic acid, used now in multiple types of surgery. But what Genzyme is mainly noted for is a drug that reverses or treats a rare genetic disease called Gaucher disease. It's one of many hundreds, in fact, thousands of rare diseases that can now be treated with modern technology. Gaucher disease, for the scientists in the audience, is a lysosomal storage disease, and it's a defect in an enzyme that breaks down a certain type of fat called glucocerebricide. It is autosomal recessive, and I'm telling you this for a reason, so bear with me. It requires two defective genes one inherited from the mother and the other from the father. And when the enzyme is defected, this fatty substance accumulates and causes damage to multiple organs. In severe cases, the brain, but in most cases to the bones, the blood-forming system, the liver, and causes a number of disabilities. You can see in a typical case the large liver and the large spleen, bleeding, bruising, anemia, mostly affecting children, or it mostly appears in children. And what Genzyme learned to do by both collaborating with research institutions and its own work is to manufacture the missing enzyme using recombinant DNA but in a form that when it's injected into the human body does not just circulate in the blood, but it is targeted to the cells that need it, the cells that we call macrophages, where it's taken up by these cells and replaces the missing enzyme. So this was a novel technology that stemmed directly from academic research labs, both research laboratories that knew how to use recombinant DNA technology to produce these proteins, a then new technology, and also on engineering of the sugar residues that are attached to the protein, that are targeting it to the cells that need it. So it was the first of what are now several personalized medicines for rare diseases. But rare diseases are rare only if they're not in your family. When I started Genzyme, I had no idea that the gene, the bad gene for Gaucher disease, was in my family. I have, as you can see here, seven grandchildren. This young man has Gaucher disease. He was diagnosed in utero before he was born 
We could tell, even from the primitive genetics in 2002, that not only would he have Gaucher disease, but he would have the form that could be treated by grandfather's drug. And here he is in the hospital. He goes twice a month for an hour and receives this drug. This drug costs 250,000 US dollars per year. But he's normal. He is perfectly healthy. He is 14. In four years, he will be 18 and will make an interesting decision. Does he want to be cured for life through gene therapy, which will rapidly develop and give him basically a life without enzyme replacements. We'll see. But my point is rare diseases, just as an example of the opportunities that face us all, rare diseases are actually not rare. There are 7,000 rare diseases. In aggregate, they affect 1 in 10 Caucasians. Uh, other ethnic groups haven't been studied extensively. But we have only cures for a tiny number. That it, well, here's some examples, I'll go back, of rare diseases, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, and so on. Some common, uh, some well-known, some not. These lack good treatment options and provide huge opportunities. And most of these rare diseases, like Gaucher 30 years ago, lack any treatment or even research on them. And certainly one thing many countries are doing, and I'm glad to hear you're beginning here, is to use genetics and understand diseases that are common in different populations, different ethnic groups, and so forth. And of course, there are many chronic diseases, like neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, autism, cancers, and so forth, that lack treatment. So there are many opportunities. But what I also want to stress is that it requires collaboration intense collaboration between research universities and hospitals and for-profit companies. That is the basic research to understand the disease and to develop a concept or a partial drug for the treatment. That can be done in basic science laboratories, engineering laboratories, and medical centers. And this depends extensively on government support of research. In the United States, it depends extensively on private philanthropy. Large gifts by wealthy donors that support our research. This is not common in most other countries. It is not common in Chile. Just as an example, the Whitehead Institute, where I work, was a gift of Jack Whitehead, $135 million 30 years ago. The Broad Institute, next door, the world's largest center for genetics and genomics, a gift of Eli Broad, $700 million. You need private philanthropy to support the work of the government, and also patient and disease-related organizations. But once that research is done, to actually get it into the clinic, to develop it, to produce it, requires for-profit companies. I'll talk a bit about gene therapy. That's all being done now in research hospitals, and it works. It's curing numbers of childhood diseases that are fatal. 
But to make this an actual treatment requires for-profit companies that produce the gene therapy vectors that can be used. This is a whole industry in itself. And what is also important as you move forward is to realize the evolution of medical therapies. We started with small molecule drugs, aspirin and the like. The recombinant DNA revolution 40 years ago allowed us to make recombinant protein drugs, monoclonal antibodies, other types of proteins that have revolutionized medicine. We're now seeing yet other types of therapies, cell therapies, and gene therapies. This is all innovative work done in research labs and in small companies. I'll give you one example, which is my latest company, Rubius, using gene-modified red blood cells. Red blood cells, you all know, are the major cell in the body. They circulate for several months, and they transport oxygen and waste gases throughout the body. My laboratory is noted for its study of production of red blood cells. All the genes and other molecules that start, that are used by stem cells as they divide and develop and make red blood cells. So the research in my laboratory focuses on, ah, here we go, focuses on genes that are turned on and off during this developmental process. And in these studies, we learned how to take human stem cells stem cells out of normal people that form the blood, the so-called hematopoietic stem cell. Put them in culture, have the cells divide almost 100,000 times, and make normal red cells. And this immediately has applicability for transfusion medicine. And many organizations are interested in that. But we also realize that because red cells can circulate in the body for three to four months, and that they have no DNA, they have lost all their genetic material, if we could attach therapeutic molecules on or in red cells, we could deliver new or therapeutic molecules for long periods of time. So for instance, we can put antibodies on red cells that will neutralize foreign toxins or viruses. So for instance, if an individual is going into a country with Ebola or with Zika or some virus, we can take that person's red cells hook on an antibody that would neutralize these viruses and therefore make them immune to these diseases. Many other applications, and I'll give you in a moment one example. Again, our laboratory does basic research. But when I presented this at a small conference at MIT, a gentleman named Nubara Fayan, who is the president of Flagship Ventures, approached me and said, Harvey, I think we have a company. The company now has $30 million in investment, has 40 people working with it, and it's making a number of drugs. And I'll just give you one example. Again, this is what we are doing. We don't know it will work, but we have every reason to think it will work. We're developing a treatment for a different rare genetic disease, 
phenylketonuria, or PKU, a disease in which the body cannot metabolize the amino acid phenylalanine that you ingest in, in foods all the time. And as a consequence, the level of this amino acid builds up in the blood and causes damage to the brain. There's no good treatment other than a terrible diet that is low in this amino acid. So what we've learned to do is as we make red cells in culture, we use recombinant DNA to express a foreign enzyme that degrades phenylalanine. So we make red cells that are normal red cells, but with a unique capability of degrading this amino acid. <coughs> Transfuse these red cells into a patient, lowering the level of phenylalanine in the blood. So we're about to go into human clinical trials once we learn how to manufacture these cells reproducibly. This is a real company, and it illustrates several points that I will elaborate on later. That is, you need a board of directors that is experienced. Remember, this is a startup company, but you notice on the board is the former chief medical officer of Merck, who has a great deal of experience in drug development. Peter Hutt is the former general counsel of the Food and Drug Administration, who helps us negotiate the human clinical trials with the FDA. Bob Langer is the most well-known bioengineer in the world, my colleague at MIT, who has started over 20 companies. This is a high-quality board of trust directors. We also have a scientific advisory board that contains leaders in science and medicine in a number of fields that the company is interested in. And the point is, we have structured the company as the as the investors have done with other companies, to give it the optimal chances of succeeding. But you need multiple kinds of people with these skills. Geography is also extremely important. What I've shown here is a map of MIT. That is this area here. My office at the Whitehead Institute is in the middle of Kendall Square. Five-minute walk in one direction is the offices of Flagship Ventures. Five-minute walk in the other direction is Lab Central, an incubator that you will hear about in the next talk, I'm sure, in which Ruby is started. It grew so rapidly, it outgrew the incubator and now has its own space in a small building that is a 10 or 15 minute walk. It's a former building occupied by Pfizer. And Pfizer grew so large that they now have their own research facilities. But the point is, it's very close. I can get there in a few minutes. I can talk to people and so forth. Let me give you a few examples of other technologies. One is Moderna Therapeutics, which is a type of gene therapy. Instead of introducing DNA, they introduce messenger RNA. They use it to make a number of products, including antibodies, enzyme replacements, other molecules a publicly traded company. I mention it also because the head of its scientific advisory board has a Nobel Prize, Jack Shostak. Again, emphasizing the point 
that it is the country's leading scientists that become entrepreneurs. Another company deals with antisense RNA, using small chemically modified nucleic acids to inhibit synthesis of damaging proteins. Again, its advisory board is headed by Philip Sharp, another colleague at MIT who also has a Nobel Prize. And these companies, as does Rubius, publish in leading professional journals. So let me quickly go through some general principles and then talk about the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center. To start a biotech company, you need a top advisory board and board of directors. It needs to be a real company who can take the ideas that you might have from your research labs and develop them into real products. It requires an entrepreneurial environment. It's best if you have, besides the uh, innovators, experienced people, people experienced in the bio business, who can also guide the company. Because what you're trying to do is, is merge science and business. You need protected intellectual property, not just patents, but freedom to operate, knowing that your product will not be stopped by someone else's patent. You need a business plan. You need solid financial backing, usually by venture capital. But increasingly, we're seeing funding of rare disease companies by philanthropic groups parent groups that want to develop drugs for their own family's diseases. The government needs to be helpful, but stay out of the way. Okay? Governments in general are good in infrastructure, building roads and bridges, schools, universities. Governments in general are not good at innovation. So provide the infrastructure and then in a good environment, regulatory environment, and then step back. <laughs> Aha. Again, faculty entrepreneurs, the freedom to spend time away from your university. Not only the freedom, but a culture in which we actually do this. Again, a top advisory board and board of directors, this gives the company credibility. If top people are involved, then the investors will listen, potential workers at the company will be attracted, and you will have little difficulty recruiting top people. <coughs> you need leading scientists, as I've stressed. You need individuals with leadership experience in the industries and highly trained and motivated PhD level researchers. But three quarters of the people that will work in these companies do not have or need advanced degrees. The country, and in the case of Massachusetts, the state, needs to have institutions that train technicians, lower level employees, and then have experts in related areas like business, finance, marketing, uh, patent law, and so forth. Technology licensing and patent protection are very important, but oftentimes the, the results are developed directly at the company and only partially dependent on university ideas. Again, this is obvious to those of you in business, but it is not obvious to scientists that you need a business plan. As I often say, you start a company to make money. And if you're not going to 
tell people how you're going to earn a profit, it's going to be very difficult to attract investors. Let me just end with a few comments about the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, which I helped to create now eight years ago when a then new governor, Deval Patrick, took office. The first thing to note is that it reports to the Secretary of Economic Development, not health, not education, but economic development. So it's an enterprise that provides 100 million US dollars per year to develop the infrastructure for biotechnology in Massachusetts. It is what is called a quasi-state institution, in that the government pays the money, but the decision how to spend the money is an independent board. And that's difficult for many governments, but it works. Because it puts the decisions in terms of what it does, workforce development and development of drugs and jobs, in the hands of professionals. It's a very broad initiative that covers not just biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, but devices, diagnostics, bioinformatics, requires and supports many skills. It has a board of directors of seven people. Three are state employees but four are outside individuals who can, I mean, the, the board works well together, but the majority of the people on the board are not state employees. I was able to convince the governor that he needed an advisory board, a scientific advisory board. This is important because we look very closely, not only at the broad directions of what we fund, but at individual grants and projects. We have leading academic scientists, all of whom have extensive business experience. We have leaders from industry. In fact, Jose Carlos used to be the research director of Pfizer. He now runs a startup company. We have a number of venture capital leaders, partners at some of the top firms. We all serve without pay. It supports science, life sciences in three areas, a tax incentive program, an investment fund for small companies, and importantly, a capital program for infrastructure. You can see the tax incentive program encourages companies to hire new employees and to expand. There are several other programs I won't go into in detail that support small startup companies. But it's the capital grant program that builds the infrastructure, building research laboratories at public and private universities. University of Massachusetts is a public university. Worcester Polytechnic is private. You'll hear about Lab Central, I'm sure, from Tim. Again, investments in infrastructure to encourage life science industries. We support, as other examples, a dental research institute that is developing new types of diagnostics from saliva that can be used in developing countries. I mentioned gene therapy. We're supporting, together with industry, a mass biologic center that will manufacture these gene therapy vectors for clinical trials at both research universities and companies. 
it supports workforce development. And this is very important. As I stressed, many of the employees in the bio industry do not need or will have advanced degrees. This is for secondary schools and junior colleges to provide equipment with matching funds from industry to train students to work with DNA, genetics, and so forth. And then finally, an internship program in which the state supports college and university students to spend a summer working in a small company so that they get the experience of working in a business. And also, the business gets the expertise of the students in whatever field they are in, biology, economics, and so forth. And many of these students take jobs in these companies. So what I've hoped I've told you this morning is how the life sciences industry works in Massachusetts from the perspective of a professor, myself, who both runs a research laboratory and teaches students, but is also an entrepreneur. There are hundreds of us in Massachusetts. And some general principles about how to start a company. And then a model, possibly for this country, of how government's support of infrastructure can encourage the growth of life science industries. Thank you very much.